And as we look through Ephesians chapter 1, I want to ask you to do something. As you look at this passage, listen very closely again to the verbs. Verbs communicate meaning in language. And though you may have detested uh, working through grammar in junior high school like I did, think about who is acting, that is, who the subject of the verb is, and who is the direct object, who is receiving the action of these verbs. And you will see that outside of verse 3, where it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, every other verb has, as the one doing it, God. God is the one who does everything that is laid out here in this tremendously high passage regarding the work of salvation itself. Also notice the phrase, in Him and in Christ. In Him and in Christ. You see, for example, in verse 3, heavenly places in Christ. Uh, in uh, verse 4, it just shows us in Him. Uh, verse 5, through Jesus Christ. And you'll see in Him, in the Beloved One, in Christ, ten times in the first 13 verses of the book of Ephesians. And before we read through it, let me just sort of head something off at the past. One of the most common ways that men have expressed to, in essence, get around the personal nature of God's decree of election that is so plainly laid out here in Ephesians 1 is to say that the one who is chosen is Christ. Christ is the chosen one and God has chosen to save all of those who are in Christ. Well, one could say that Christ is chosen. Uh, he was certainly chosen to be Messiah. He was chosen to be the one who bears the sins of God's people. And it is certainly true to say that God has chosen to save all those who are in Christ. But that does not change the fact that the direct object of the verb in Ephesians 1 is personal. That is, God chose us in Christ, not cho God chose Christ, and then we add ourselves to Christ so that you have this concept that is very popular today of class election. The idea that God has chosen a class of people in Christ and that the direct object of His choice is not the individual, but instead to save all those who are in Christ. Almost any system that attempts to, in essence, explain away Ephesians 1 boils down to this assertion, that God has elected not an individual or any one person, but God has elected a plan. God has chosen to save. Now, how a person gets saved then is still left basically up in, in the air and it is basically, the, the, the normal assertion is, well, God has chosen to save those who believe in Christ. And so whatever your group teaches you must do to believe in Christ now becomes the condition upon which uh, you, upon that fulfillment, can enter into this class that is elect. But the individuals in the class are, are not determined by God. Instead, the object of his choosing and his election and his determination and his decree is a plan, not a people. So in essence, it becomes impersonal in the sense that while it's personal in Christ, it is impersonal in that those who are of the elect are not part of the decree that is left up to man. So as we look at the passage, ask yourself, is this saying that God has chosen to save us or that God has chosen to save as in a plan? And see what comes out of the text. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us, first verb, God does it, He blesses, direct object, us, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. This blessing is only found in Him and in Christ. If there's anything this passage clearly teaches, it's that the move these days to be inclusive of world religions as having validity before God is utterly foolishness. That the blessings of the Gospel are blessings that are firmly and clearly given by God in only one way, and that is in Christ. Just as He chose us, 
Chose is the verb. He is the subject. Us is the direct object. In Him, before the foundation of the world. In Him and before the foundation of the world provide us with further information about this choice. But the first and foremost assertion is God does the choosing. The choosing is personal. It is individual. The realm in which God's choice is exercised is never outside of Christ. It is only in Christ. And the temporal element is this choice took place before the foundation of the world. It is an atemporal or non-temporal choice in the sense that it precedes creation itself. Now, you might ask the question, well, He chose us, but us didn't exist yet. So how can it be personal? Well, it can be personal in the same way as the Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. The issue of the individuality of a person is, from God's perspective, something that is absolutely certain, unless you think that somehow God is not in control of such things. And as we will see, Paul will say that God granted to us grace from eternity itself, which is a mind-boggling thought. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, for what purpose? That we would be holy and blameless before Him. Now, please note that the purpose that is provided to us is very much a personal purpose. Being holy and blameless before God is not something that is predicated of a plan. Plans are not holy and blameless. People are holy and blameless. And the purpose of God in His election of a people in Christ is that he, they would be holy and blameless before Him. There is never and never has been any element of Reformed proclamation that could logically or rationally, not that I said hasn't been, but could be logically or rationally used, to promote the idea that you can simply go out and do whatever you want to do. You don't have to be concerned about godliness. You don't have to be concerned about doing what's right before God because, hey, as long as I've got my ticket punched and I'm of the elect, all is well. That is never, ever, ever a, a, an issue in the preaching of these passages because of the fact that we know that the whole reason that a person is chosen in Christ Jesus is so that we would be holy and blameless before Him that we're made a new creature in Christ. We're given a new heart, a new desire. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will. In love, He predestined us to adoption. Again, the action is predestination. God is the one who does it. The direct object is us. The realm of this act of predestination is said to be that of love. It is a loving action. And the result of this predestination is adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself. Again, when you think of Romans chapter 8, what could be more personal than adoption as sons in Jesus Christ? The Spirit testifies with our spirit, Paul says, that we are the sons of God, the spirit of adoption whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. This is extremely personal. And so this act of predestination is not predestination of a plan or something impersonal, but of specific individuals to adoption of sons through Jesus Christ to Himself. And what is the basis? It is according to the kind intention of whose will? His will. It is amazing to me that given the frequency of the use of the phrase His will, His will, His will, that what we hear in so much writing today is my will, my will, my will. It is a total reversal of the emphasis of Scripture. If we were to emphasize that which Scripture emphasizes, then we must constantly be emphasizing the kind intention of God's will, not the unkind intention of our will as it normally expresses itself. So He predestined us to adoption of sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved, that is, in the Beloved One, Jesus Christ. So, what is the purpose of this act of predestination? It results in 
It is purpose in the sense of bringing us into adoption. It results in the praise of the glory of His grace. Not to the praise of the worthiness of my will. Not to the praise of my wisdom that I, in the minority of all of mankind, managed to see the truth. I was more spiritually sensitive. I was maybe more spiritually wise, whatever it might be. If we say that the fundamental decision and the issue of predestination lies upon man, then we have to, in some way, shape, or form, say that those who choose Christ, those who choose to go the right way, in some way are better than those that do not. Better in some way, maybe not morally, but are they more intelligent? Are they more spiritually sensitive? What is it that separates them? And if we find that difference in man, that makes one man better than another. Instead, the Scriptures place the difference why one man differs from another not in the realm of who we are because we all stand evenly condemned. Instead, the reason that some receive His grace, this grace granted from eternity, is to the praise of the glory of His grace, not anything that we have done. And when people say, well, why would God do this? What's the ultimate answer? I would say to you, you can't get much more ultimate than verses 5 and 6 of Ephesians 1. And yet, because it does not give us specific answers about a particular individual or in a particular place, so many are not willing to accept that fundamentally the final answer to the question, why, is the praise of the glory of His grace. This grace, this glorious grace of His, was freely bestowed, not as a result of the fulfillment of conditions, but freely bestowed on us, again, only in one way, and that is in Jesus Christ. I remember when I first started studying the Bible as a teenager, really in depth, uh, I, I didn't understand that. Because I thought the Beloved, since I wasn't using the American Standard, I thought the Beloved meant, you know, like when the pastor gets up and he says, Good morning, Beloved. You know, I thought it was in the church. I thought it was a plural thing. The term here is singular. It is the Beloved One, the Beloved Son, Jesus Christ. And so again, this grace is is freely bestowed on us, and grace again is a very personal thing, in the Beloved One, Jesus Christ. In Him, we have redemption through His blood. In the Beloved One, we have not a theoretical redemption, but we have redemption through His blood. His blood actually provides redemption to us, as we will see later this evening as we look at the issue of the atonement. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace which He lavished on us. Now again, I'm I'm probably taking too much time here, but uh, it is amazing to remember talking with a Roman Catholic man after a seminar once on the atonement of Christ. And he was saying, uh, you, just, you just completely misunderstand what the Bible says. Christ has redeemed everyone. Everyone is redeemed. Now we have to take advantage of that redemption and obtain forgiveness of sin. And I pointed him to Ephesians 1.7. I said, look, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Well, those are two different things. No, they're not. The forgiveness of our trespasses in the original language is renaming redemption through His blood. And he just would not accept that. No, 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 you're just twisting the Scriptures. Uh, uh, you know, I, I believe what the Pope has said in this issue literally was his, his response. But the redemption through his blood is the forgiveness of our trespasses. And again, it is according to the riches of his grace which he lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times that is the summing up of all things in Christ things in the heavens and things on the earth. In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will. In Him we have obtained an inheritance. And the Scripture says we have been predestined. According to what? According to His looking into the future and seeing we would select Him? No. According to His purpose. And He is the sovereign God who works all things, not most things, but all things, after the counsel of His will, not after the counsel of man's will.